<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. How you doing? Great. Not, thank you. Bad, eh? Yeah. One more day. Yeah. That's yeah. about it. If I nod off during the uh, presentation, feel free to wake me up, yeah. and I'll do my best not to uh, put you guys to sleep as well. Uh, this uh, this workshop tonight is uh, kind of part three of uh, of a, a CSI series. But uh, from the, the week where uh, we started talking about the beginning of the week, cool. we died. I'll let my technical guy take care of that. No, that's the power cord for him. Oh, don't touch. Don't it. touch. Okay. Anyways, our uh, our first workshop at the beginning of the of the week, uh, we talked about our learning philosophy, our teaching philosophy called experiential education, and within that, in our second uh, indoor workshop, we talked about a little bit more about how we learn, uh, how the brain is wired, how we create learning circuits, <coughs> different uh, stages of development, be it acquiring knowledge learning a motor skill, or performing a uh, skill that you've already learned. What we're going to talk about tonight is our decision-making process. This is an evolution of our six-step lesson planning process, whereby for young instructors, new instructors, we had what was called a six-step lesson planning, and uh, hey, we're pulling, it's off kilter. We can fix that. Uh, and what we, uh, what we did is it was a very simple system. Right, where you uh, looked at the student, you assessed your terrain, you assessed a skill, you developed that skill, and so on and so forth. When we look around the room and you look at each other and you look at what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as far as expert ski instructors or people who have been teaching for a long time, we don't necessarily follow a set pattern, do we? We don't have a step system that we go through. What we tend to do is we look at it the, the student, we look at the environment around us, and from there we make decisions. So as opposed to teaching a very segmented uh, teaching system or methodology, we decided that why can't we teach anybody, be it a brand new level one, thank you, ski instructor, or, or all the way up to our, our experienced demo team members, why don't we work right from the beginning at teaching them how to make decisions? So I'm going to take you through our decision-making model. I'll finish it off with uh, how this blends into uh, our new learner progression, our, our entry-level uh, teaching progression as well. And we'll finish things off that way. So as I said, this is a big, you know, the big picture is our uh, experiential education uh, model. What we're going to focus on tonight is designing the experience. Designing that ex experience requires the ability to make decisions. Decision, as, as I look at this, we kind of have a, a four, fill, instead of steps, I call them filters, whereby you start big and then you put another little filter of decision making and another one and another one until you get to the point in which you've been able to make your final decision. So the first one is called the learning contract. And the learning contract has four uh, bullet points to it. The psychological state of our student, the physical state of our student, the experience that they've already had, and that's not necessarily ski experience. It can also be just experience in life. We'll go over that a bit more. And their objectives or goals. More so, not so much the objectives, but their goals. So breaking it down on the psychological side, what we're asking our instructors to do, before they, they start thinking about where, what run they're going to go on or anything like that, they're going to take a look at their student. Okay? And they're going to say, well, what's the psychological state of my student right now? A, number one, are they ready to learn? That could be part of the day, that could be you know, the first time you meet them, whatever it might be. Sometimes it takes us a while to warm up to the point in which we're actually ready to accept information and practice and turn that into knowledge. Are my students apprehensive or are they engaged? From there, the second part of our learning contract 
is the physical side of things. Physical literacy, and that, you know, this can go from uh, entry level skiing right up to expert level skiing. We know that as we are, you know, we develop our physical literacy at a young age, and we lose that, or we lose our ability to gain that as we get older and older. And so we're looking at, and you can assess this the way that people walk out of their, their rental shop to, the way they're carrying their skis, the way they're leaning on their poles or not. You can tell if they have the ability to just base their basic movement patterns, <coughs> motor, motor, gross motor patterns. <coughs> From there, other things that we're looking at, we ask our students if they've had previous injuries because that's going to affect the decisions that you make. Their age and their gender can also have effects on the decisions that we make as we go through the process. Our third step here, or our third uh, thing to look at is our, their experience, as I mentioned before. Anything ski related would be great. How many times have you had a student in your lesson that, you know, and we get this a lot in our entry level certification programs, our level one program, where you have people who have been skiing for 25, 30 years, but have actually never taken a ski lesson. Have you had that? Yeah. Um, other sports will obviously have uh, an effect on how we can work with our students. And have they been in that lesson, like I mentioned? Have they been in any lesson? A tennis lesson, a golf lesson, surfing, whatever it might be. And from there, then we also ask for their objectives or their goals. We want to, by the end of that discussion, have a specific goal. And that specific goal needs to be shared between the learner and the teacher. Okay? And this early stage gets our students involved very, very, very quickly in two-way communication. And it places some of the responsibility of the learning on the student. Because yes, we ask them for their goal. But then we also have to discuss the time frame that we have. We may only have a half day, we may have a week, we may have a year for working with an athlete. And then the limitations and the opportunities that we can draw from those goals. It becomes your check and balance throughout the lesson, throughout the day, throughout the week. It's something that we tie back into throughout. It's not just at the very end. But it can happen after a couple of runs, it can happen at lunchtime, it can happen again at the end of the day, the next day, whatever it might be, where we check in with our student and together assess whether or not we're heading in the right direction. We assess whether or not we feel that we're making progress. I remember it's a great story. I remember uh, one of the areas in our country, I don't know if you're familiar with Canada or not, is our prairies, right in the middle. And uh, some of the ski resorts there are pretty small. And I remember going out for a professional development day, and I was brand new, level four, young, ready to go, thinking I'm going to share my wisdom with the world and these instructors. And I get out there and we start talking technique and all that. Like, I just I didn't ask them what they wanted from the session for one. It's mistake number one. Didn't enter into a learning contract. We got well, about an hour into it. I said, Well, how are things going, you guys? What do you think of all this great stuff that I have just handed to you and shared with you. And the guy said, you know what, to be honest with you, Warren, we don't really do any of this stuff. Our day-to-day -day business is dealing with about 20-ish children at a time for an hour. They get off the bus, they show up, half their buddies get up on the hill and they're ripping down. They've got these 20 kids and at the end of the hour, what they need to be able to do is ensure that they're safe because you know they're gonna go up the hill with their buddy after whether you tell them to or not. And they're gonna try and come straight down, you know, a blue pitch or something like that to see with their friends. Okay, so it's really important that we understand and formulate this learning contract very early on in our lesson. The second filter that we put into our decision-making process is your situational awareness. We make decisions based on the terrain that's around us, the learning environment itself, is it a group of 20 kids in a very crowded beginner area, or do I have that perfect flat slope, groomed, sunny day, and the, uh, the snow conditions, is it icy, is it powder, whatever it might be. Okay, so in the conditions, snow, visibility, temperature, the learning environment, the slope, what's the degree of the slope, does it slope off to one side, does it get narrow at the end? 
What's my safety factor at this point? From there, we look at the terrain. We call this terrain-assisted development. We think they, all ski instructors have been doing this for decades. Right? You use a side hill for a certain reason. You go over a roll for a certain reason. You use a concave piece of terrain for certain reasons to help you develop your student. Those are all natural. But there are areas now, and it's happening in Canada, and it's happening a lot in the US, where they're building specific terrain features that will, that will assist in our students' ability to achieve the goal or the skill that you're trying to develop at the time. We'll go through that, the terrain assist development, a little bit later. So our first step, Create a learning contract with our students. Second step, look around you. Look at the terrain available, look at the weather, that kind of idea. Third step, choose an objective based on what you've just witnessed or what you've just understood. So right now, I notice that my student's a little bit tired. It's the end of the day. I notice as we came around the corner, the weather started to change and they look a little bit more apprehensive than they did on the previous run where they just had great success. So my objective as I got around that corner, I've lost my visibility and the terrain's gotten steeper is probably to slow them down. And within the objectives, we have three sort of checkpoints here. What is my speed? Well, I'm gonna to try to slow this person down. What turn shape might work best? Well, it's a busy slope. We've already looked at our terrain. So maybe it's a short radius turn. Maybe it's wide open. We've got lots of space around us. So then I look at, maybe I could use a larger turn shape to try to slow them down, bring them across the slope a little bit more. And level of ski performance. Well, should it be carved? Should it be skidded? Something in between the two? So those are the objectives that we choose to help our students down the slope. And then the last filter then, when I know my student in the shape that they're in, and I've taken a look at the terrain around me, I've chosen the best objective for my student at the time, then I ask myself, well, what am I gonna develop? And how am I going to develop it? What am I going to develop? The tools that we give our ski instructors in Canada is our technical reference. You might've heard our commentated uh, run the other day on Tuesday there where we talk about four guiding principles where we turn with the lower body so on and so forth so our students start to hone in on a target that's going to allow our students to achieve that objective that you've selected that's called our technical reference and that's our assessment tool that's how we have a painted picture of what we feel is efficient and effective skiing for all levels of skiers all terrain all types of equipment and how do I develop, how do I actually get my student from over here where they're, maybe it's their stance that's con, you know, off a little bit to way over here where their stance is a little bit better, a little bit more centered, a little bit more balanced. And so we use two ideas here, one being ICRCB. This is a motor skill development scale. I being initiation. Is my student, is this something brand new? Is this a new skill? Is it a new part of the body that we're engaging? Is it a new stance? Is it a new ability to engage the edge? All the way up to CV, which is create variation. Where is this thing going athlete that I've been working with for years and years and years? They already have the skill, we just need to tweak it a little bit. Maybe the timing's off, that kind of idea. And all everything within there. And then the actual movements that we're getting the student to achieve are called our skills. Pivoting, edging, stance and balance, pressure control, and or the timing and coordination. Okay, so those are the very specific tools. This whole process kind of takes us and turns us 180 degrees from where we used to be as an organization. We used to start here, right? We would watch, you know, we've got a great assessing eye. We'd watch our students go, oh, I can fix that person, and off I go. I grab them and say, I'm gonna help you, and the first thing you start working on skills, and away you go, and then eventually down the road, like I used to do, make mistakes, figure out, you know, that's not what they wanted in the first place. And if, or, 
maybe that is what they wanted. And I was able to teach them how to pivot. And they can face down the hill and they don't spill their tray of drinks. And then they go away. And they try to face down the hill and not spill their drinks no matter what size turn they're doing. No matter how fast they're going. No matter how steep the pitch might be. No matter how icy or how much powder might be built upon the edges. And I've made this person skilled but not skillful. They know the skill of pivoting, but they don't know how and when and where to use it. So we've taken that model and flipped it on its end. So as I was mentioning, the terrain assisted development is something that we're really starting to engage in. Again, it's nothing brand new for all of you in this room. I'm sure you've all used a bump on the side of the hill to develop something in somebody's skiing. Right? I'm sure you've uh, taken somebody and side slipped them down a berm to teach them how to stand on the outside ski a little bit better. You've used the environment and the natural features around you on your mountain. But as I said, there are certain areas now that are building these on purpose in their beginner's area with rollers and little spines that you can walk up and walk down. And so we look at you know, the use of mini pipe berms, bank turns, convex, uh, rollers to develop rhythm, and that kind of stuff. So instead of listening to my voice any longer, we've got a little video here I want to show you that kind of gives you a better idea of how we're using terrain around us. Not only the natural features, but also the, uh, the terrain that's been built at some of our ski resorts. now offers specific terrain features to enhance the experience of entry-level clients. Both man-made and natural terrain provides opportunities for learning and a great way to engage new skiers. Even with limited skills, these features create the sensation and thrill of real skiing in a safe and fun way. The instructor becomes a guide and coaches the learner through situations. The focus is less technical and more oriented to creating outcomes. A mini half pipe or other concave terrain is the best way to get people slide. There is no risk to letting go, so this gives the skier confidence and the sensation of gliding rather than breaking. Climbing and moving on small ridges or berms develops edging skills. Navigating these small features creates natural balance on the edges and on the downhill ski. Turning can be developed on bank terrain or shaped berms. This helps the new skier change direction with limited technical feedback. Speed is controlled naturally by the shape of the terrain and the line that is chosen. External cues like brushes or lines in the snow are helpful tools. The focus is on the environment and executing the task rather than technical aspects. Small rollers are a fun way to build confidence and discover the thrill of acceleration in a controlled environment. This develops stance and mobility as the learner moves to stay in balance. The right terrain builds confidence and creates a focus on the fun of the activity while developing specific skills. Use terrain assisted development and make learning to ski a fun game. <laughs> It's a little bit easier on the ears than listening to me tell you all about that stuff, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, um, so you know, very similar to what you just saw there, once you filter through, as we looked at our student, we assessed our students' physical, mental state, all that kind of stuff. We then looked at the environment that's around us, the <coughs> opportunities, the teaching opportunities that we have around us based on the, the terrain, the weather, and snow conditions, things like that. We choose that objective, okay, we want somebody to be able to slow down now, that's the key for them. 
The student doesn't rarely comes to us in a lesson lineup. You say, hey, what are your goals? Say, what would you learn to do? Most of them don't say, I want to learn how to pivot better. Right? Most of them would say, you know, when I get to the black runs, I can't control my speed. So they are, they understand, they're connected to that objective more so than the skills that are involved. So we talk about now that our goals, our teaching methodology, we are objective driven and skill developed. The skill then becomes a tool. It's part of the science, no different than biomechanical principles or the laws of physics. Right? It becomes one of our tools in our toolbox as opposed to the lesson. It's a tool within the lesson. So I'm going to show you one last video here and I show you how this we've we brought this into our uh, beginner progression. We used to have a beginner progression very similar to our six step lesson planning where it was very sequential. You do, first you teach them how to just be mobile, mobile on their skis and then you teach them how to slide and now you got them sliding, oh my gosh, you better teach them how to stop. Okay, now they can stop, but that's not gonna help you all over the mountain, so you better teach them how to turn. You get them to teach one turn one way, then you teach them the other way, and they say, well, what's next? Well, we better link those turns, well, let's link those turns, and then all of a sudden you're parallel, <laughs> right? As opposed to going through, and, and that's what we taught our young instructors. We taught them to memorize a system as opposed to make decisions. So where we're going now with the gliding experience is this, we have of four objectives within our beginner to intermediate. One being mobility in the skiing environment. That's not just mobility in your stance, but it's the ability to get from point A to point B. It might be pushing with your poles, or skating, or sidestepping, or the herringbone, whatever that might be. Just teaching them how to get around on this foreign equipment that they have. The second one being gliding. We want them to be gliding with comfort and balance and not breaking. So we need to choose the terrain, and you can see the decision-making process that it would play in. So we're looking at gliding, anything that gets them gliding. Again, that could be pushing with their poles, or a slight downhill, whatever it might be. Once we have it, then we talk about direction change, and that's to help them control the speed. Once you get sliding, teach them direction change, again, as opposed to braking. Right? We want our students to have the freedom of movement as opposed to the nervousness of braking. And last, speed management. When you get somebody turning, obviously they have to learn how to control their speed through turning. That may be in a parallel stance. It may be in a snowplow stance. And we've gone away from teaching the snowplow turn versus the parallel turn because in reality, turning is turning. The only difference is you might have a wider, more stable stance with your toes pointing together, which helps you increase friction underneath your feet and maintain or control your speed a little bit for you. Or your feet might be parallel or somewhere in between sometimes. We're not so focused about, focused about a specific turn in a snow cloud versus a specific turn in a wet or in a, in a parallel stance. It's just how you're standing on your skis. So I'll show you the, uh, the video that, again, takes my voice out of it, puts a little bit of music and some better pictures in front of you to explain it a little better. The gliding experience provides the tools to discover skiing. Learning to ski can be challenging, so it's important that the first experience is fun and focused on the excitement and pleasure of the sport. Instructors target four key objectives and develop skills through a variety of tactical, student-centered objectives. Mobility in the skiing environment is the first priority. This starts by getting familiar with the equipment. New skiers start to move and explore the learning area on one ski or two. Learning to push with the poles provides stability and gets people moving. Climbing accesses more terrain. This can be done by sidestepping or with a herringbone approach. The instructor is always ready to help. Falling is part of learning and getting back up is part of the skier's mobility. 
moving around develops confidence and coordination and provides access to a new environment. Gliding with comfort and balance is at the core of the skiing experience. Flat terrain helps put new skiers at ease. Reducing the perception of risk is essential for learning. A relaxed stance reduces fatigue and improves balance. Skating on flat terrain develops a feeling for moving from foot to foot and sliding. An instructor can help timid students by holding the ski tips or by skiing backwards in front of them. Learning to glide is a question of developing confidence, so repetition in easy situations works best. Once a skier discovers the thrill of gliding with wind in the face, they are hooked. Direction change gives control and rhythm to new skiers. Learning how to turn the ski and grip the snow can take many forms. At first, most skiers need the stability and edging provided by a snow plow stance. Others can turn with skis parallel if the terrain is easy and this is often more comfortable. For beginners, perfect technique is not the priority. It is more a question of getting the job done. The size and shape of turns will vary with terrain and situations. But creating rhythm makes balance more natural and develops the feeling of real skiing. Speed management is an essential part of skiing. Controlling, maintaining, and increasing speed are all good options depending on the situation. At first, slowing down is often achieved by a snowplow stance with or without the help of an instructor. Single turns and hockey stops provide a way of stopping. As confidence builds, it is time to let go of the snowplow a bit and maintain speed with even turns. While it may not seem like the natural thing to do, letting go is a big part of control. It helps you to relax and stay balanced. Round turn shape is important as skis are designed for smooth arcs. Across flats or with sticky snow, carrying speed is essential and momentum makes it easier to turn. Looking ahead develops awareness for terrain changes and lets the skier decide whether to control, maintain, or increase speed. Learning to ski explores a dynamic new environment. It is a fun activity and doesn't have to be perfect to be exciting. Discover skiing, the gliding experience. So the, uh, just a, a quick summary with the, the gliding experience, how it, instead of having a, a step system, you, you are, our student is at the center of that circle. And our instructor looks, does this skier need to learn how to control their speed right now? Or does this skier just need a little bit more mobility? No matter whether or not they're, again, as I said, in a snowplow stance or parallel stance. Whereas when I look around, in our country and I go to different learning areas and I watch new instructors, a lot of times I see them get stuck on those stages because they're focused on the stage itself or the step itself as opposed to an objective and they end up perfecting a snowplow stop and they're getting students to break as opposed to glide. <coughs> so that's where we're going with things right now with the our, our methodology. Uh, I've got some cards up here. If any of you want, uh, we're going to be posting uh, these videos. Actually, I think we just put this one up online, but they're on our website, snowpro.com. You're welcome to go and take a look or take my card. Uh, any of the PowerPoints that we've done this week and videos that we're putting up, uh, by all means, if you want the link to those, just send me an email and, uh, and we'll get that stuff to you. So I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the workshop and I thank you guys for being here. I know it's been a long week and you're tired and... Uh, 
but uh, you pushed through, so I appreciate it. If you have any questions, I'll be here. We'll at least our next uh, speaker has come up and get set up. But uh, if not, then I'll see you guys again at the party, I suppose. <laughs>